Hello, everyone, um, and welcome. Um, I am Evangeline Marzak. I am the founder and producer at Piccolo, uh, which is a, an iPad app um, and game development studio. And um, I'm also, in my day job, uh, the mobile strategist at Ubermind. We make uh, custom apps for Fortune 500 companies and were recently acquired by Deloitte. Um, so um, I'm giving this talk because I did a lot of things the wrong way and uh, I would have really loved to have somebody sit me down and tell me the things I'm about to share with you today. Uh, the talk is pretty low on visuals um, on a slide, so take notes as you feel free, uh, tweet if you would like to, um, or just uh, sit back and listen and see what strikes your fancy. Um, what I'm going to tell you about today is essentially being in business. Now, when you're going indie, what you're doing is not just making an app, not just making a game. You are actually making a studio. You're making a business. Um, that means you're a company. Um, and in order to be sustainable, in order to uh, keep doing it, in order to fund your employees, you have to make money. We're all in this business because we're passionate about it, but this is our lifeblood. We have to make money. Um, so now you think of yourself as a company, and then you don't have to think of yourself as somebody with an app idea. Um, in fact, you will probably go through lots and lots of product ideas before you find one that really takes off. Um, either you go through a lot of them before you actually make one, uh, which is another strategy I'll talk about shortly, um, or you make a number of apps, none of which are successful until you get to your hit, and that's actually quite likely. Um, so your job is now entrepreneur, and your job as an entrepreneur is to reject good ideas. You have to go through about 100 good ideas before you get to a great one. Um, and you might go through 10 great ideas before you get one that you can actually execute. So that phase of figuring out how you're actually going to make your company sustainable is incredibly important. Um, figure out if this is a lifestyle that you want. Do you want to be running a company? Uh, do you want to keep your friends employed? Um, at this point, if you're an indie, you're probably going to be hiring or making a team out of your friends. Um, and those people better be people that you're all but married to because they're going to be dependent upon you. You have to make the right decisions because they have to be able to pay their rent at the end of the day. Um, now, as a caveat, what I'm talking about is creating an app development studio in order to do gaming. Um, if at some point in your business plan it says, and then Google buys us, uh, your company is your product, not your apps. So get to know your buyer early on, figure out what they want in an app development studio, and then make that. Um, because you're making a company, you have to think about strategy, not just an idea. People can succeed and have succeeded without a strategy, but that's lucky, it's not inevitable. And the point of this talk is really to give luck a much smaller role in your business. So the first thing that you want to do is actually define what success looks like for you. Um, for me, for Piccolo, success is having enough monthly income from apps to sustain three full-time employees, have six months of expenses in the bank, and enough leftover cash to replay, repay our investors twice their original investment. That's very specific. It's also ambitious, and it takes a long timeline. It takes a minimum of three years to do that, which means that we had to, as a business, decide that we need to be sustainable for three years before we get to that point of success. Um, so that is another part that you'll have to think about, is how are you going to make this sustainable? Um, assuming that everything takes three or four times as long as you think it does, uh, which it will, what's an income source that you can get immediately? What are income sources that you can generate that will keep you sustainable long enough to be profitable and long enough to be financially secure as a business? Um, you can get a day job to do this. This is what I'm doing. Um, and that's sustainable for years, but it will take about 80% of your time and your energy. So you need to also define failure, and that's something that I'll go into a little bit later in the talk. But when we titled this as um, how to ship an app and not die, that definition of failure is actually how you will keep yourself 
as an indie, as a producer, as an entrepreneur, from not going under, from not burning yourself out. Um, and then you need to find several strategies for profitability. That means you need a plan B, C, D, etc. Um, there are two schools of thought here on how you actually approach making a, uh, a profitable game development studio. And one of them is sort of Zynga's model, the go big or go home model. Um, and that is when you sink all of your money into something that you believe will have a lot of traction in the market. You think that's going to be the next Angry Birds. And then you spend your money and your time and your effort making that. The other one is what I would call the Ocean House Media or the small bet strategy. Um, this is making tiny, really easy to wrap your head around technically apps that you can sustain a lot of. You can do this over and over and over until you actually hit one that makes a hit. Um, Ocean House Media makes the Dr. Seuss children's books, um, but before that, they were in business for several years. Their first app was a Tibetan bell on the iPhone. It was a picture of a Tibetan bell and a sound when you tap it. Then they made cards, they made greeting cards, they made calendars, they made books, they made all kinds of things, and today they're a very successful studio. My thinking personally is that most indies don't have the money to be Zynga. They do have the money and the effort and the time to be Ocean House Media. Um, so, but that goes to your personal strategy for how much risk you're willing to take on in order to make that succeed. Oops. All right, so the first thing that you have to think about is what do you have? Um, and that means that you're looking at your competitive strengths. What do you have that no one else does? Now, in our case, we have a brilliant artist and we have a writer who's also an engineer. Those people's strengths define what our products are. Um, it's also a constraint. So I might, as an entrepreneur, have the best idea ever for this massively profitable QuickBooks killer. We're not going to make that because we can't and we shouldn't try. Other people can do that better than we can but other people can't make interactive books as well as we can because, again, our strength is we have a writer and we have an artist who are both brilliant. The second thing is that you have only so much money. Um, now, when you're starting out, it's very easy to try to expand your capacity to fit your idea. Don't do that. Do it the other way around, and I speak from experience here. Look at what you have available in terms of the people and in terms of the money and the time that you have and constrain your idea to fit those. Once you're profitable, then you can actually put more money into a grander idea. But when you're first starting out, scope your project to fit your constraints. That means if you have three months worth of budget before you go under, you have to design an app that you can produce and ship in one to two weeks. That means it takes one to three weeks to get app store approval, it takes 32 to 76 days to get paid. That gives you one or two weeks in order to actually ship your app. So scope your project appropriately. Um, with that constraint, you will go under unless you do anything other than the technically most basic app. Um, and the other thing is that you have only so many effective work hours in a week. That's not how many hours you could physically work. It's how many hours will actually be produced under real world conditions. People get sick. Contractors deliver late, MacBooks crash, you get press release, writer's block. It's going to happen. Plan for 30 hours a week of output per person. No, really. Even if you have nothing but full time and really brilliant, young, energetic people, plan on 30 hours a week per person. That's what's your effective capacity. That's different from your maximum capacity. And a lot of um, independent developers and a lot of small businesses in general make that mistake. The next thing you have to do once you know what those constraints are is to pick your project. You have to do this very, very carefully, and this in fact might make the most difference on whether or not you can actually ship an app. Um, you have to make a few assumptions. First of all, you can do less than you think you can. No, really. Uh, that goes for you, that goes for your team. Remember that effective capacity. You can do less than you think you can. Scope accordingly. Uh, the second is that your tool set is going to define your product and vice versa. Um, so decide on your tools very, very carefully. Um, don't choose a tool that will commit you to expensive projects. 
uh, when we started out, we used the Unity game engine, um, and I was familiar with developing 3D game assets in a 3D game, but that committed us to very extensive projects. So I would say for an indie, stick to 2D games. Um, stick to tool sets that will allow you to cut features mid-development, to cut characters, to cut art, to cut levels. Um, pick a project um, or pick a tool set that will allow you to scope your project down when you need to. Um, also remember that any given project will be twice as expensive as you think it will. Um, and again, that's an, a failure of entrepreneurs generally and game developers in particular. Assume that if you budgeted $4,000, it will take you eight. It will, if you budgeted two weeks, it will take you four. Um, also remember that your resources are finite, even if they don't seem so. Even if you have a day job that's piping income into your business, assume that that's a finite resource. Assume that an emergency will happen that will take a lot of that money. Um, assume that you personally can work a maximum of 50 hours before you start to screw things up on a weekly basis. Um, so don't budget yourself for more than that. That will help you execute very well, um, and it will help you avoid making critical mistakes at the time when you're most tired and there's the most pressure. Um, assume that somebody else has had the same game or app idea that you have and may have already started work on it or shipped it. Do search the app store in order to look at those products. Um, if you find a project that was done reasonably well and is not selling well, Assume that the market has spoken. Don't spend your money building a better mousetrap if everybody in town already has a cat. Go on to a different idea. Remember, pick great ideas. Um, for platforms, at this point in time, iOS is really a no-brainer. Um, your app's use case will determine whether or not you're going to do iPhone or iPad or both. Um, but really concentrate your effort and your strength on one platform at a time. Unless you have a great Objective-C coder and a great Java coder on staff, don't port until you've proven success. Um, for us, our Android apps always track the success of our iOS apps, um, meaning they're basically a percentage of sales, um, but it's a very, very low percentage of sales. It's not worth doing for us as an indie. Um, the Kindle Fire is its own platform. I look at that not as an Android platform, but as its own Kindle platform, even though it's based on 2.1, it's a fork of Android. Those are actually different users. It's a different demographic, um, and they may actually spend more money than Android users do. Um, we find that um, regardless of whether you're making a downloadable app that's for pay, or you're making, say, a custom app for a real-world retail store that actually ships products, um, an iOS user will actually spend more on those real-world products than an, I, than an Android user will. Likewise, they will download more apps, they will pay more for more apps. Um, so I would say Kindle is your second choice if you can afford it and if you've already proven success on the iPhone or your iPad. Um, if you ship an iOS app and it doesn't make any money, don't even bother. Um, so just go right to Kindle. Also, the Amazon Android App Store is very, very tiny. We were able to be number one in our category with 12 sales that day, um, whereas with iOS, it was, it was easily 20x of that on that same day. Um, so iOS first, then Kindle. Go for Android if you really, really like it, and preferably if you have a free app. Um, so now that you have sort of selected your constraints uh, and selected your competitive strengths, selected your project, um, you need in order to staff this up, first of all, money. It takes a minimum of about $2,000 to make a phone-based app and about $7,000 to make a tablet-based app. Uh, you do have to consider your hardware costs in that, as well as your Apple developer fees, as well as your own opportunity costs. And your opportunity cost is what you could have made had you been doing something else. Um, so, for instance, if you quit your day job, you have to count that paycheck that you didn't make as part of your opportunity cost. Um, I actually saw an iPad game demo at PAX. 
Uh, they had four talented developers working on it full time for no money for nine months. Um, but if you do the math on that, that no money free app um, cost them about a quarter million dollars. If you consider a talented iOS game developer can command about $80,000 a year or more, um, depending on the market. Um, and four of them work for nine months, it's about $240,000, $250,000. So do consider that when you're looking at whether or not your app can actually be profitable. Uh, for tools, get off-the-shelf software whenever it is you possibly can. Don't roll your own unless you're very, very talented at doing that and you intend to make that a product. Uh, you can't afford to spend time making tools, um, again, unless they are your product. Um, so buy it off the shelf whenever you can. Get it for free whenever you can. That goes particularly for game engines and for analytics. Um, again, we use Unity. It's a good engine, lots of support, but we've actually moved over to AppCellery or Titanium. Um, it has a little bit less support, but it's 2D, so it allows us to have much, much lower asset costs. Um, and it's basically free. Um, so uh, analytics, I'm not an expert on, but there are free analytics tools or pay per user analytics tools. Um, go for free whenever you can. Um, and go for highly supported but free whenever you can. Uh, check out Moai if you're a very, ex uh, very um, experienced developer and you know Lua. Uh, do check for new tools every six months or so. Um, the middleware market is actually very quickly moving. New middleware can be fantastic and can revamp your entire company and your business strategy. Uh, search for good support. That's crucial. Uh, the next thing you need is people. And first and foremost, you need somebody who can write code or somebody who can learn how. Be that person if you can. Hire that person and put them on payroll if you can't. Outsourcing is not as cheap or easy as you think it is, um, particularly if you're working across time zones and particularly if you have a distributed team. You will be up around the clock and you will start to make mistakes. Um, you can also expect to pay anywhere from $20 to $30 an hour for a good outsourced developer in this market. Um, whereas if you pick somebody who's inexperienced but passionate about the project and smart and able to learn, you can pay about the same and get them working on your same time zone, preferably in the same uh, local area. So, Hire them if you can, and if you can provide them with steady work. Uh, some business strategies require that you take time off between projects. For instance, you might work on your own um, sort of consulting gigs for six months and then take time off and work for three months. You can't put people on payroll when you do that. Use contractors in that case. Um, use contractors for anybody that you would have to lay off, because seriously, laying people off sucks. Um, do check your local employment laws to see whether or not somebody that you think is a contractor is actually an employee. Um, in the U.S., an employee is somebody that you direct the manner in which they work, um, and especially if you direct the hours in which they work and the tool sets and they don't work for anybody else. Do check that out. Figure it out before the Department of Labor figures it out for you because there are a lot of fees associated with that. Um, so contractors are great if your business is really volatile, if you need those gaps. Um, if somebody is critical, put them on payroll, um, especially your engineer, especially your developer, because it costs a lot of money to support your app if somebody new has to come in and learn your code base and figure out what your app actually does in order to make an upgrade to it. Um, the next person you're going to need is a bookkeeper. Get a good one. That's mandatory. Um, do not do that yourself unless it's your background and you can devote at least 10 hours a week to looking at your books. Get somebody else to do that for you. Make sure you trust them. Do check references, and I speak from experience on that. Uh, budget at least $200 a month for it if you're in the U.S., um, or about $200 a month. Um, another person to have on your, uh, your Rolodex is a good talent agent. On the U.S. West Coast, I like to use Filter or Vitamin Talent. They're both good shops. Uh, regardless of who you use, it's really, really helpful to have a single point of contact that you can call up and say, hey, I need an audio engineer for 10 hours and I need 
two hours a week for a marketing consultant and to have that one point of contact where they can just send you good people. Um, uh, get to know that person and pay them immediately. Um, pay all of your critical people immediately. You'll, you might get into a fight with your bookkeeper on that one because they will tell you to um, pay at the last possible day. Like if somebody sends you an invoice and says, uh, pay within 30 days, they'll tell you for your cash flow it's better to pay at the end of 30 days than the beginning. That's generally true, but if they're a critical person, pay them immediately because shit will go wrong and you need those people to be on your good side when that happens. Um, a good lawyer is a good ally to have in the U.S. Um, don't spend much more than about $500 on it and don't bother with a specialized contract for basically anything unless you're licensing intellectual property, like if you were uh, licensing the right to send a comic book in order to make an iPhone game out of it, do spend money on that one. Um, I use Ironmark Law, um, but any good intellectual property attorney who has game experience, um, uh, again, do check references. All right, so now once you have all the people in, the pla in place, now you actually have to produce an app. Um, do use a structured project methodology. I like Agile, um, and I like using Pivotal Tracker for a task management tool. It's cheap, it's lightweight, it works on the iPad. Do hold daily stand-up meetings, even if there are only two of you, even if you're doing it via Skype or Connect. Um, do put that structure into place so that you can keep on top of things. Um, I like doing sprint planning sessions, so we have a deliverable at the end of every week. And, um, and then every day we just check in and see how we're doing against those deliverables. Having that structure make, goes a long way to actually shipping. Um, and it, uh, it has the effect of really limiting scope creep. And that's important regardless of what size of game developer you are. Um, but particularly when you're an indie because you really cannot afford scope creep. Um, once you know what your feature set is, it's better to cut than it is to add. Um, so once again, use free tools whenever possible. That's another reason I like Pivotal Tracker um, and Skype and Connect. Don't pay for web conferencing um, and don't pay for tools unless you absolutely have to have them. Do keep on top of what everybody is doing. Um, that's your bookkeeper, that's a contract artist, the guy that you emailed over at SoundSnap. Um, by the way, SoundSnap is a great audio file resource. Um, it's cheap. You can get a, a whole package of sounds that are high quality for like 20 bucks. Um, the keeping on top of everybody will take about 15 minutes per day per person on your team. Uh, so on a team of two, you might spend five minutes to half an hour a day. Um, averages about two, about 15 minutes. Um, on a team of eight, that might take half of your day, depending on how um, far distributed your team is across time zones. Um, if you can afford to hire somebody half-time for marketing, do it. The app store is way too crowded to ignore it. Um, if you can't, which most people can't at this stage, um, make it everybody's job. Uh, everybody blogs, tweets, sends a press release, talks to people, talks to their friends, and you get that gets those people to Facebook, tweet, make a fan group. Whatever it is that you can get the word out, um, do that. If you're taking that small bet strategy, I would say market your company first and your app second. So anytime that you send out a message, a press release, a, a blog post, you're talking about your company primarily and then your app as the next project. Um, and that's so that you can basically get the same message out. Um, your message will get lost if you send out one press release saying one app name, and then two weeks later another press release saying a different app name. If you've got something that people can hook onto and say, oh yes, I know that studio, um, then you can start to get a lot more traction in the marketplace, and that's a better use of your time. Um, the other thing to do is to keep accurate records and particularly do data backups. Um, if you lose your data, your business goes under. That's the equivalent of a factory fire. You've just lost everything if you lose your data. Um, we like to back it up on at least three different forms of media. So we use Dropbox, we use external hard drives, and we use DVDs. I actually go so far as to mail those DVDs to another state um, just in case of catastrophic event. Um, 
Now there, there's a debate between sort of data backup versus security. And at this stage of a, an intro indie developer, you've got to be far more worried about loss than about security. Um, and you pretty much have to keep in mind that if you're successful, people will crack your game anyway. There's not a lot of, of uh, there's not a lot of good backups for that unless it's by changing your business model, to, for instance, to be subscription only or, or ad driven. Um, but do worry more about loss at this stage than about security. Um, I just made every security professional I know um, simultaneously roll over in their graves and groan. But um, at this stage, worry more about loss. Um, when success happens, assume that it's going to happen for two weeks and then it's going to vanish. In traditional games, um, your product life cycle is about 90 days before you, um, you see those, that usage taper off to maintenance levels. In apps, it's about two weeks. Um, so our first app made $947 in the first week. Um, I assumed, luckily, that that was going to be short term, which it was, it lasted a couple of weeks. Um, now it's been about two years, and it provides about $150 to $300 a month. It's lower in some months, higher in others. Um, for us, it's August and December. A lot of people get new devices, so a bunch of new users come on to the, the App Store ecosystem in December. Um, and August, because our first game happened to be a, a foosball game, um, so that's football or soccer, depending on where you live. Um, and we specifically targeted a non-US market. And so, um, so when non-US holidays happen, we get a bump in sales. That means that with our first app, we made about $3,000 the first year, about $2,000 a year after that. Um, the cost of the app was $12,000 all told, including all of the um, update and support costs. Um, that means that that app is going to be profitable in 2015. And that's the most success we've had. Again, we have a long-term small bet strategy, so we can absorb that. And that was done deliberately. Um, but that is a quote-unquote successful app at an indie stage. Our second app made $12 the first week. Remember I said that we were on the Amazon App Store number one in our category. That was $12. Um, our third app made $0 in the first week, although it made $30 in the second week. And each of those now sell about you know, two to five copies per week. So there's a substantial drop-off in popularity of apps after those two weeks, which means if you're going to make an update to that app, have it ready on week three. Um, by ready, I mean pushed through the App Store. So you have to be working on that immediately upon shipping. That's going to give you that bump in order to extend those two weeks out. Maybe you can get four weeks or six weeks. As often as you can release updates to a successful app, do it. If in the first week you don't see sales um, and, the and the second week doesn't start to give you a bump on that, drop that app and move on. Don't bother. Um, because success in apps is short term. Um, if you're going to seek investment and you get a, an app as a major seller or it's featured on the What's Hot or the new and noteworthy list, um, seek investment then. Don't wait until an app has failed um, and don't try to do that before that. Prove success and then immediately ask for the investment that you need in order to get to the next success. Remember that's not to the next app, that's to the next success. Um, as a caveat, before you go to friends and family, do remember that there's no such thing as free money. Um, this will change your relationship, it will make you business partners, and it will mean that you have to have uncomfortable financial discussions with these people. So choose them wisely. Now, as a corollary, um, you have to set up failure conditions. Know when you have failed before it is unrecoverable. That way you can move on and you can um, succeed in a long term, even if you have failed in the short term. Um, so you have to do this at three levels. You want to set failure conditions for your app, for your strategy, and for your company. And in any of those cases, if you, don't miss, if you do meet your failure criteria or if you don't meet your success criteria within a specific length of time, quit, change what you're doing, and move on. So 
at a project level, um, you want to set up in advance when it is that you're going to cut and walk away. Um, if some of you are old enough to maybe remember the Kenny Rogers song, The Gambler, it's uh, you've got to know when to hold them, know when to fold them, know when to walk away, and know when to run. You absolutely need to set those levels on your project before you start. Um, so, for instance, if you're making an iPad game and you budgeted $8,000 for it and eight weeks, you're seven weeks in and you spent $10,000, you know you can ship again in, say, two weeks, it'll cost you just another $4,000. You have to look at that $4,000 not as just a little bit more, but as enough to ship two more iPhone apps. That's when you cut your project just suck up the sunk costs in the $8,000 or $10,000 that you've already spent and look at what you can do to be profitable out of the money that you have left. Um, kill the iPad app at that point, even if it's a fantastic idea. You need revenue coming in and you need it now. Um, so look at all money in terms of what could this do to be profitable. Now at a strategic level, um, we've actually changed our strategy about every six months. Um, we look at, are our apps succeeding? Are we getting them out on time? Are they on budget? If um, are our competitors just killing us? Um, if so, change your strategy, change what you're doing. That might mean firing your team and starting with a new one. It might mean firing yourself and letting your team go on without you. That's what I did. That's why I have a day job. Um, and it might mean changing your strategy completely. So it might mean that you started out in 3D games and moved to 2D. Or it means you started out in games and now you make music software. Um, change what you're doing if it's not working and do check on that every six months. Now for the company, um, usually with entrepreneurs in general and game companies in particular, um, the failure condition is, oh, and now we're out of money. You want to set a target before you are underwater that says we will get out of business when we have X dollars left in the bank or when our nth app ships without breaking even or when we have gone for so many years without being profitable. Set those up in advance. That will do everything to keeping you personally going in your business to know what that failure criteria is and that there's a life beyond it. Because it's easy as an entrepreneur to get very myopic and to get tunnel vision into what you're doing. So that's a hard thing to do and it's a hard thing to master is to look at the money in the bank and say, well, we could go for another eight weeks. We could ship another app, but that would run us out of money. Quit before you get there. Figure out what that that uh, bar looks like and stick to it. It's hard to do, but it will save your life. So there are a number of takeaways um, here, and I, I hope you've been taking notes or tweeting or just seeing what sticks. But these are the things that are the key, key points. The first thing you have to do as an entrepreneur, and especially as a game developer, is to pay yourself. We do this because we love it, but love is not going to pay the rent, and you need to be able to pay your own rent. Um, and, and some people might think I'm speaking facetiously, but no, literally, don't kick it out of your apartment. Um, give yourself enough to live on and have at least some luxury. Um, that might mean that once a week you go out to a movie. That might mean you give yourself 10 hours a week just to play Skyrim. Whatever it is, have some luxury. Allow yourself some time off and that will do wonders to allowing you to keep leading your company. Your company lead, needs your leadership and you can't do that if you're hungry, you're tired, and you're stressed. The second is that it takes the same amount of hours and work and blood, sweat, and tears to launch just a normal work-a-day knockoff app as it does to launch something earth-shattering. So don't put in your time on something that's not worth it. Don't put in the years of your life and the investment on something that is not deep at the core of what you want to do in the world. Make sure that your company is capable of being a game changer, otherwise it is not worth the time and investment. Third is get a mentor. Talk to somebody who has been in business themselves. 
That can be somebody who had a game company and failed at it. That can be somebody who runs a cafe and succeeds at it. As long as they've been in business and they understand not only the practicalities of running a business in a studio, but also can have a good perspective on telling you when you're putting in too much time or not enough effort, when you need to change what you're doing, that's invaluable. In the US, you can talk to SCORE or to Mercy Corps. Um, and in other countries, Mercy Corps has an online um, component where you can pair yourself up with a mentor if you don't know one personally. And the last thing is be yourself and do what you're good at because nobody else can be you. There's a sign up at Walmart in their online divisions that says, you can't out Amazon Amazon. Um, figure out what you can do that nobody else can do and just do that. Uh, so with that, I will um, turn it over to questions from the audience, and I believe that the moderator has a few of those. All right, uh, we have a question from Jate uh, Widobunyat. Uh, when we sell the first app, should we have both versions of the app, free or paid, or just the paid apps? Also, what do you think about the free apps when the ads compare to the paid apps without the ads? Uh, that depends on your app and your business strategy. Um, I tend to look at um, apps in terms of the price of a cup of coffee, um, and there's a lot of talk about that. I don't think it's actually meant to be an analog. I think that, they, that customers literally look at apps in terms of the price of a cup of coffee. Um, so if you look at your app and think, gosh, um, this provides me with the same 20-minute break and sense of luxury and... Um, you know, and this sort of deep satisfaction experience that a venti mocha would. Well, then you can charge $4.99 for your app. If, on the other hand, your app is sort of more analogous to, say, a donut, like it's something that you can look at while you're in line and maybe it, it gives you a little bit of pep, that's probably a free app or at least $0.99. Cents. Um, so it really, really depends on how high quality and how much um, time and effort and, uh, and multi-use your customers are going to get out of that app. Um, and, and that's not something I can really answer. Um, we have done all paid apps, um, no free apps, um, so I can't speak to the paid versus free revenue model. Um, when you look, um, there, there are a number of good statistics out there, and, uh, and it looks like they're uh, it looks like the free apps tend to be a percentage of the revenue, not, um, not a giant percentage. So it might be, say, 40-60 split between free and paid. Um, but uh, if you're on Android, you're more likely to want to do the free app simply because Android users tend to pay less or be less willing to actually buy a, a paid app. Okay, uh, so we have another one here. Uh, within your own successes and relative failures in the App Store, have you noticed any meaningful trends in launch timing? Uh, what are the better times to launch a company's first app? This is from uh, Baru Shahari. Sorry if I screwed that up. <laughs> um, uh, again, this depends upon your app. Um, we always see a bump in sales around the holidays, around the winter holidays. Um, uh, so starting at um, the end of November, we see a bump in our sales. Um, uh, that's also a pretty competitive time. Um, and we've also seen bumps in sales in um, August, which is uh, obviously European holidays, and in June, which is when school lets out in the U.S. Um, so you can time that around just the, the general nature of, of the, uh, the, the ecosystem expanding as people get these devices for Christmas presents or graduation presents. Um, and the other thing is if you have a seasonal app, for instance, we had um, Jabberwocky that did really well around um, uh, in October because that's the Halloween season in the US and so you know, creepy stories are in vogue. 
Um, so you can, um, oh, and also our, our, our football, our, our soccer app did really well during the World Cup. Um, yeah, so, so it depends upon the design of your app. All right, so for the next one, um, let's go ahead and turn to um, Frederick Hessier. Uh, he was wondering, how do you balance your time between your full-time job and your indie dev uh, development company? Uh, that's a good question. I usually budget about um, 50 hours a week total, um, which means that if I have a 40-hour a week job, that's 10 hours a week that I can devote to this other, um, uh, this other endeavor, which is basically to um, sort of manage my company. Um, the way I've done that is actually to delegate pretty heavily the responsibility to those on the staff. So my, my artists and my engineer together get to, a lot of make, uh, get to make a lot of decisions. Um, and they email me, and they know that if I can't get back to them within 24 hours, they have the authority to make the decision and move on themselves. So, for instance, um, you know, uh, my artist just sent over the storyboards for our next uh, coloring book, and, um, and I just sent back saying, I can't look at this until next Tuesday. If you like it, go with it. Um, and so it, it involves giving up a lot of control, um, but... Uh, um, that is the trade-off I had to make in order to have enough money to not only support myself personally, but to have the, uh, the income and savings available to bail the company out when an emergency happens. Um, so just assume that you've got 50 hours a week and you can split that however you want to. Okay. Uh, so for the, uh, for the next question, uh, we have Samuel Batista. And he was wondering, uh, what are some possible strategies to get a little bit of low-risk capital to uh, motivate other people to help you move your project along if you're a lone developer trying to make a small mobile game? Um, just to make sure I understand the question, I'm, I'm, I think you're asking, um, basically, how do I get money when I'm on my own at this? Um, I have been told that Kickstarter is a great method of doing that. I have not um, used that personally because I don't have the time to manage that project as well as the development projects. Um, so uh, having a day job is a great low-risk way to uh, get extra income. Um, and the other thing that you can do is just start with the cheapest, simplest app that you can possibly do um, and start proving success. So if you can do something yourself and get that out there, then you can prove to the people who would work with you that you are capable of actually shipping a product um, because most people can't. Most people will start a project and never finish it, which means that they won't ship. Um, and a lot of the really good and experienced people are sort of leery of that syndrome. And, um, and you want to be able to prove to them that, no, you're really serious about getting this done. So I'd say um, if you can afford the time on Kickstarter, do it. Um, if, you, uh, if you want to get a small business loan, you can do that. Um, there are microfinance options. Um, in the US, you can go to Axion, A-C-C-I-O-N, um, and, and look at uh, small loans for a short period of time. Um, uh, other than that, um, the best thing to get to fund a company is revenue. So get a product out there. Um, and it might be another product. It might be that you do something else entirely. You do woodworking on the side and you use your woodworking profits in order to fund your app development. However it is that you can do it, do it on your own and prove to people that you are going to be successful and you're going to do this professionally. Okay, we have a, uh, another question from uh, Jose Manj. Uh, and he was asking, uh, what would you suggest for a beginner who is starting to search for people to join him in a new venture? Um, I, I believe that's a, basically the same question. Um, is if, if you're a beginner, you really can't go wrong by proving that you can do the work. Um, and now you should specialize in doing something. Um, so, for instance, if you are really interested in doing um, you know, the artwork, or if you're really interested in doing sound design, 
you're really interested in doing engineering, do those things and prove that you're good at them enough that you can impress other people on the team. Um, and that's not because you need to impress people in order to, uh, to get them to work with you, although realistically you do, but because you want to gather a group of people that all want to impress you as well. Um, and because that's when the greatest work happens. So I would say um, the first thing I did when I was starting in the game industry in 2004 was um, I made a mod. Um, I just bought Inter Never Winter Nights and I made a Never Winter Nights mod and that proved that I could prove to myself first of all that I could actually do this um, and prove to other people that I could actually finish this. Um, so being able to do something yourself and being able to finish it are the two really big things. Um, uh, do you scope your project and do keep yourself to deadlines? So um, uh, do not allow scope creep in that and do set very, very tight timelines. Take small, small chunks. See what you can do in a week. Set yourself small goals and accomplish them. Okay, we have a, a quick one for you uh, from Uk uh, Batman. Uh, what was the tracker tool you mentioned when you were talking about Agile? That's called Pivotal Tracker, P-I-V-O-T-A-L. Um, there are a number of free tools, um, and you can use you can use Basecamp, you can use Zoho. I selected Pivotal Tracker because specifically because it works on iPad and because they have a free um, uh, they have a free subscription rate. Okay, uh, and we have a uh, one from Bruno Santos. Uh, do you think we should target any major audience? Imagine a game named Color would be better. Uh, would be better named color and the American spelling, uh, spelling or uh, color with the U, which is the uh, UK spelling. Uh, these sort of things is what he's wondering gotcha. about. Right. Um, I actually recommend doing that because we had success at doing that. Um, when we first made um, uh, Two Foods, which in retrospect I probably would have called Babyfoot, um, uh, in the U.S., the name for table uh, football is uh, foosball. Um, elsewhere in the world, it has other names. Um, but I also assumed that somebody else, uh, and we started doing that the very, literally the first day the iPad launched was the day that we started designing for that. Um, so, but I assumed that somebody else was going to come out with a competing game and that they would probably target the U.S. market. That turned out to be correct, um, and the way I designed it, um, was very heavily impacted by the fact that we didn't want it to be targeting the U.S. market. So it's more ornate, there's no language in it, um, we use a different kind of style of jersey, um, and that has proven successful because we're able to capture a market that the other game doesn't capture. Um, and yes, looking, looking at demographics, looking at different user bases is really important. Um, and is actually a more sophisticated sort of business question than most indies tend to, to look at. Um, so I would say that um, a better business, regardless of what kind it is, is one that delights its very specific customers. If there are enough of those customers and if that market is growing quickly enough to make that business profitable. Um, so it might be a little bit of a stretch to say target, you know, rural woodworkers on iPad who live in Finland. Um, you know, that might be cutting it a little bit too finely. Um, but yeah, if, if, you, if you look at a particular type of person who has a particular type of need or desire and you can fulfill that well, you will stand out to those users and those users will not only buy your app, but they will market you for you. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Then we got to wrap it up. Uh, this is from Tyler Coleman. He was wondering, is it possible to get an app recognized through press releases and reviews, even if it's been on the market for a week or two? Um, maybe. <laughs> uh, that's going to be up to the, uh, the venue to which you send the press release. Um, we got ours out within a couple of days for the very first one, and we got Ghana Sutra to pick it up, um, and we got a few others to pick it up, and that was very, very helpful. Um, so if it's been out for a week or two, you'll probably have to search for a story. 
So the story isn't necessarily we shipped an app. Um, you know, figure out what the story is that will allow a journalist to actually look at that and think, you know what, my readers would be interested in that. So um, we wrote our, our first re press release not in terms of we shipped an app, but actually telling the numbers behind how much it costs and how much revenue we were making. Um, and that was an interesting enough story that journalists were, it, were willing to pick it up, even though it had been a day or two since, uh, since we'd shipped. Um, so you have to be a bit more creative when some time has elapsed, um, but uh, make the journalist's job easy, and they will probably thank you for it by actually publishing your press release.